Uh, so I'm actually going to start today with a story. And it's a story of something that happened to me last year. I was driving between patients. I see patients in their homes uh, doing house calls. And I turned on my radio. And on the radio was a medical topic, which isn't usually what comes on on this program. And they were talking about mammograms. And as some of you may know, there were a series of articles last year that raised questions about the harms uh, and the things we don't tell people that might make them make different decisions. And so one of the things that was interesting was there was a physician speaking, and she was reducing what's a fairly complex and emotional literature to really clear points. And I'm thinking, who is this person? And wow, she must have media training. She's doing such a great job, and I'm very impressed, and I'm driving along. And then they take another call. And the caller says, well, and they had just been discussing whether or not to do mammograms in women in their 40s. And the caller says, well, my sister was 42, and she had two small children when a mammogram found breast cancer. And she went through hell, but she's alive today, and her kids are now in their teens, and that wouldn't have happened without the mammogram. So the speaker responds empathetically, which was appropriate, and then she begins to discuss the difference between what's good for populations and what's good for individual patients. And the entire tenor of the show and the calls changed. And it wasn't that she was any less clear or compelling about the data than she had been before that call. And I think I know why everything changed, and they changed in a bad way. They changed in a way that her authority and her ability to connect with them and explain to them what she thought might be helpful to them was diminished. And that was because of a type of communication that didn't exist until recently and one in which she probably didn't have training. So through most of history, medical communication was this. It was a doctor speaking to a patient, patient-doctor communication. And that's still true today. And then over the last century or so, there was a second type of communication, and that was scholarly work. But that was done by a tiny fraction of clinicians, physicians, and others. But now this is what our desk looks like. I mean, sadly, uh, Abraham Verghese has talked about the eye patient, which is the virtual patient. Uh, in the modern world, you almost don't need to see the patient. You can look at the computer, so they say. Anyway, this is what our desks look like. And this has really changed how we can communicate in some pretty exciting ways. So this man is Clay Shirky, and he's an expert in technology. Uh, and he talks about a new communications ecosystem. And by that, he means an ecosystem is how everything relates. And he talks about how this new technology, how the digital era has changed how we communicate how we learn, how we interact. And you know this, right? You walk down the street and everybody's got their phone as they cross the street. Uh, we know each other, you know, several of the people here I know via Twitter, even though I live thousands and thousands of miles away. Now, not surprisingly, uh, this has affected medicine. So this guy is Kevin Foe. You may know his blog, Kevin MD, which gets something like a million or two million views every month. So he was a primary care physician in New Hampshire. And what he noticed was when there was a new finding, he would get the same phone calls or emails from patients and he would have to give the same response. And that wasn't very efficient. So he came up with the idea of a blog. This was back when they were called web logs. Uh, and he would write it once and most people would get their questions answered and that made him more efficient. Uh, and it also made sure that he was answering everyone's questions, and then eventually it gave them a chance to respond to him and for him to be in conversation with a larger number of people. This guy's Bob Wachter. He was the guy that coined the term hospitalist. Uh, and he was one of the first people in the United States to talk about quality and safety, which it's a little funny that we didn't really start talking about quality and safety in medicine until the last 10 years, but nevertheless. Um, so <laughs> Bob has published hundreds of medical journal articles, but what he realized when he was talking about quality and safety was that he wasn't speaking to the right people. And in order to speak to the right people, he had to speak to the people and to the policymakers. And the best way to do that was to write a book. 
and he wrote a book called Internal Bleeding. And then he started blogging and tweeting. And that was when the quality and safety movement got moving, not when he was writing articles for medical journals. This is Roseanne Leipzig, who is a geriatrician in New York. And she mostly doesn't do any of this digital stuff. She's done it once, and she did it in the New York Times. And it was basically the sum of her life's work, talking about uh, how we don't train people to take care of older people and the harm that that does. So one of the points I want to make today is public medical communication is everywhere. Some people will do it a lot. Some people will just do it sometimes. It was, however, the number one emailed article from the New York Times for two weeks. And this is Alex Smith, a young researcher in my division, who came up with uh, ePrognosis, the tool to, to look at prognosis, and the blog GeriPal. And he promotes his research in an interesting way. So a lot of people spend many years on research, and a few people read it. If you actually look at who reads things, it's pretty distressing. So what he figured out, yes, uh, you know, more read the title, and fewer the abstract, and fewer still the paper. So he figured out if he wrote an essay about the problem that his five years' worth of research was solving and published that in a different journal, and then wrote a blog post about the essay, uh, that he would have a greater impact. And in fact, the blog was followed by people at uh, the Associated Press and the New York Times, and it went international. And because of that, his many years of work got far more attention than it would have, even though he published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is a very high-impact journal. So the new communications ecosystem has already changed medicine. And one of the critical ways in which it's changed it is that it used to be, if you think of the old ways, doctor talking to patient, hopefully listening, but not as much as we'd like, or somebody publishing research, you couldn't talk back to it. You couldn't interact from it with it. You couldn't learn from each other. And so one of the great things about public medical communication is that it happens not just by health professionals, uh, but by people who have been patients, who have had cancer, or who have lupus, or diabetes. And you will see a familiar face there. And we did not set this up. It's uh, pretty funny, actually. All right, so public medical communication is communication of various forms, right? So I'm going to talk a lot about writing, because that's what I do, but it can be video, it can be audio, it can be through social media. And it's aimed at not your usual circle. So if you're a patient, maybe you're speaking to also clinicians. And if you're a clinician, maybe you're speaking to the public. Or if you're a rheumatologist, maybe you're speaking to pediatricians, and so forth. And it's really to further our understanding of health and health care and to transform that, to make it better by talking about it together. Lots of different ways of doing this. In medical journals, they didn't used to have these sections that were narrative, but now, I don't know about you, but every Wednesday in my inbox, I get the New England Journal, and I can't see the science in my inbox. In the little preview screen, what do I see? I see the essays and stories. And that's not by chance. That's because they know they will get more readers if they put those things ahead of the science. Because as it turns out, health professionals are all human beings. And as Marie said, human beings respond to story preferentially over other sorts of data. Also newspapers, also social media. OK, so here we are at our desktop. But really, what I'd like to spend the rest of the time doing is talking about how we actually do this. Because it might seem like something, oh, that's what they do. It's not what I can do. But there are many different ways of doing this. And we do courses at, at UCSF with students, uh, with residents. Uh, I do it with practicing professionals. And after an hour and a half to two hours, all kinds of people can tell very effective stories or communicate in ways and with audiences they might not have reached before. It turns out that people who are passionate about this and thinking about this are pretty good at public medical communication. So there are five tips, and I'm going to go over them in order. These aren't the only five tips, but these are five I like. So the first one is no jargon. Right, so imagine you start with saying 69-year-old with HTN, CHF, DJD, DM, et cetera, et cetera. Not very captivating, right? But <laughs> If you say 69-year-old, former topless dancer, now 
<laughs> now worker's advocate, grandmother of three, suddenly experienced shortness of breath, you have way more people's attention. Why? Because that's actually an interesting human being. It's not a list of diagnoses. Uh, and the jargon doesn't help anyone, even those of us who know what it means. Next. So <laughs> this is again where we overlapped uh, the Paul Zach. So, so I won't say that one again, except for that making them care. One of the most effective ways, as we've already heard today, of making people care is to tell a story. And the story has to have has to elicit both distress and empathy. In Paul Zak's lab, he's actually a neuroeconomist, which means that he's measuring uh, what happens in the brain when people give money. What makes them give money? You know, and you know, money's terrific and, and we all need it, but, but think also of votes or a change in behavior because it's probably the same neurochemistry. And you need a certain amount of distress to get people's attention and then you need empathy to inspire them to act on it. So stories are a good way of doing this, but there are other ways too. How do you get people's attention? How do you make them care? You can have a tie-in. So I showed a, a slide of Roseanne Leipzig, and her one article was published on July 1st, and it begins, as they do, I'm not gonna get this quite right, but as they do every July, uh, interns fresh from medical school are showing up for work. And the second sentence is something to the effect of, uh, Laura has it that this is not a good time to get sick, right? So you're thinking, okay, so I was going to have my heart attack on July 2nd, but now I'm actually going to reschedule for November when these guys know what they're doing. No, but and, and her article actually didn't have a lot to do with that, but she found a tie-in and that gets people's attention. You can also be counterintuitive. If they believe something, tell them something else. Make people care, surprise them. Uh, I guess one of my other favorites there was uh, Atul Gawande, the surgeon writer in the United States. Uh, one of his uh, great articles was called Letting Go, and it was about palliative care. And it starts with, and, and as you probably know, most people who die are older people, but not everyone. But it starts with this. Uh, Sarah Thomas Monopoly was pregnant with her first child when her doctors learned she was going to die. That's a powerful first sentence. It's the rare person that isn't going to care about a young pregnant woman dying. Uh, and it really grabs people's attention. So lots of ways of getting their attention and making them care. Getting personal. This one's a little hard for health professionals, right? Because some of the training is that you're, you're supposed to put on your white coat, literally or figuratively, and you're not supposed to be a person anymore. But actually, if you are a person, whether it's with the patient, I would argue, or certainly publicly, you get way more attention. And I think actually this is particularly true for doctors because people see doctors as not caring or foreign or on their pedestal. Uh, you can get personal in all kinds of ways. You can get personal by telling personal stories from your practice or from your life. Uh, and that's an interesting way in because then you are first and foremost a person and you can pull in later your role as a health professional. And you can also get personal by taking people on a journey with you, learning what you learned. And this is Diane Meyer, uh, a physician in the United States, and she had a great article in Health Affairs a couple months ago talking about uh, why there were certain physicians who would order tests and procedures that were of no use on people who were dying. And she said she'd always wondered, and people said, oh, it's for money. But she knew it wasn't for money, at least not most of the time. And she couldn't figure it out. And then she had a patient, and she actually asked the oncologist, so why are you going to do those things if they don't help her? And this oncologist had been taking care of this woman for about 10 years. And it turned out it was the only way he knew how to show he cared. Right? That was the only way he knew how to interact with her. And so if you can learn something in your life or your practice that's of use to others, that's a way of getting personal. You don't have to divulge all your inner secrets. Less data is more. This is also hard for, for uh, people who are scientists, particularly those who spent five or ten years working on something. But imagine if this was a whole forest. You wouldn't see this tree. You wouldn't see its shape. You wouldn't see what makes it interesting or unique, and you wouldn't remember it. Less data is more. Maybe one piece, three at the most. The less you use, the more they remember what's actually there. 
People recognize this guy, this is Joseph Stalin. Uh, and he actually made the data case better than anyone else. He said, one man's death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. And people who raise money or try and get attention know this. If you talk about a whole country where people are suffering from a disease, you get about a nanosecond of most people's attention. You get down to one family and you've got more people. You get down to two people, you have more. And if you get down to one, you have exponentially more. One person's story is the most effective mode of communication. And then finally, it's good to know what you want. You don't always know what you want at the beginning, but this is a framework I like for thinking about what you want. Do you want empathy? Do you want people just to feel for a certain class of person? So something we often uh, come to in geriatrics because uh, old age tends to scare people. So if they could just feel empathy and acknowledge the humanity of older people, I'd be quite pleased most of the time. Learning, learning something with someone, raising awareness about an issue, and then there's advocacy, and that's when you have a specific ask. Here's what we need to change in policy. Here's what we need to change in education. Okay, so there's our desk, the modern world. Uh, and this can happen in, you can use public medical communication in many different ways. I guess I'd advocate for using it responsibly. These techniques work really well to market things, uh, but that's not what we're talking about here. Public medical communication is a term to distinguish using these skills for the good of health and health care from people who do use it just for marketing, just for making money. So I'm going to finish by reading uh, a story I wrote which came from me as a person, but was informed by me as a physician. And it's also to give you a model for sticking with this. So this was a story, shortly after it happened, I wrote it down, because it, it stuck in my mind. And then a few years after that, I sent it out to places, summarily rejected everywhere. No interest. And you'll see why, but I was, I was pretty angry about uh, something that had happened, and I was talking about mistakes that they made. And it was only a few years after that when I began thinking, what did I learn? Why am I still angry? What does this have to do with me and healthcare more broadly that it actually became a piece of public medical communication uh, that people were interested in? So I'll just read a bit of this and then I'll finish. Four weeks after his quadruple bypass and valve repair, three weeks after the bladder infection, pharyngeal trauma, heart failure, nightly agitated confusion, and pacemaker and feeding tube insertions, and two weeks after his return home, I was helping my 75-year-old father off the toilet when his blood pressure dropped out from under him, as did his legs. I held him up. I shouted for my mother. As any doctor would, I kept a hand on my father's pulse, which was regular. No pauses, no accelerations or decelerations. My mother was 71 years old, unfortunately quite fit. She had been making dinner and said she dropped the salad bowl when I yelled for her. She took the stairs two at a time. Something about my tone, she said. Together we lo lowered my father to the bathroom floor. I told her to keep him talking and to call me if he stopped, and then I dialed 911. In the emergency department, after some fluids, my father felt better. My mother held his hand. We compared this new hospital with the last one where we'd spent so many weeks, but which had been diverting ambulances elsewhere that evening. The doctor came in and reported no EKG changes and no significant laboratory abnormalities except that the INR, the level of how thin the blood is, was little above the target range. The doctor guessed the problem was a bit of dehydration. He would watch for a while, just to be safe. My mother waited with my father. The rest of us filed in and out, not wanting to crowd the tiny room. Then my father's blood pressure dropped again. I told the nurse and stayed out of the way. She silenced the alarm, upped the fluids, and rechecked the blood pressure. It was better. But less than half an hour later, we listened as the machine scanned for a reading, dropping from triple to double digits before it found its mark. The numbers flashed, but the silence alarm remained quiet. I pressed the call button, and when the nurse arrived, I asked her to call for the doctor. When no one came, I went to the nursing station and made my case to the assembled doctors and nurses. They were polite, but their unspoken message was that they were working hard, my father wasn't their only patient, and they had appropriately prioritized their tasks. I wondered how many times I had made similar assumptions and offered similar assurances to patients and families. 
After weeks of illness and caregiving, it can be a relief to be a daughter and leave the doctoring to others. But I had been holding a thought just beyond consciousness, and not just because I hoped to remain in my assigned role as patient's offspring. At least as important, I didn't want to be the sort of family member that medical teams complain about. Now that I'd apparently taken on that persona, there was no longer any point in suppressing the thought. Although the differential diagnosis for hypotension is long, my father's heart was working well. I had adhered to the carefully calculated regimen that we'd received for his tube feeds and free water intake, and he did not have new medications or signs of infection. Those facts and his overly thin blood put internal bleeding like a neon sign at the top of the differential. I rested my hand on my father's arm to get his attention and said, Dad, how much would you mind if I do a rectal? Dad. <sighs> we doctors do many things that are otherwise unacceptable. We are trained not only in how to do such things, but how to do them almost without noticing, almost without caring, at least in the ways we might care in different circumstances or settings. A rectal exam on one's father, of course, is exactly the same as other rectal exams, and also completely different. Uh, luckily for me, my father was a doctor, too. When I asked my crazy question, he smiled. Kitty said, do what you have to do. So I did, and then I took my bloody glo gloved finger uh, to the nursing station to prove my point. I realize that walking to the nursing station holding aloft one's bloody gloved hand is not an optimal tactic from a professionalism <laughs> standpoint, <laughs> but it worked. A nurse followed me back into my father's room, saw my panicked mother holding a bedpan overflowing with blood and clots, and called for help. Within seconds, the room filled, and minutes later, when the ICU team showed up, I stood back, a daughter again. In retrospect, what is most interesting is how much more comfortable I felt performing an intimate procedure on my father than demanding the attention of the professionals assigned to care for him. Abiding by the unspoken rules of medical etiquette, I had quieted my internal alarms for more than two hours. Instead, I had considered how doctors and nurses feel about and treat so-called pushy or difficult families. And as a result, I had prioritized wanting us to be seen as a good patient and a good family over being a good doctor daughter. And that goes on, but I will stop there. Just to say, I most often do write about geriatrics, but there may be times where being personal makes a difference and makes a start, and also helps you learn about ways we can improve health and health care that we might not see looking only from our professional capacity. So I hope you will take full advantage of our new desktop and workspace. Uh, and I just want to remind you that there are many other ways of doing this. These are three of my colleagues who are taste testing the best liquid bowel preps to see what that's like, right? And that's educational. That's learning. That's actually raising empathy. We prescribe things. We don't know what they taste like. And patients get them, and they don't know what they're going to be like. But you can watch this video, and you will know. <laughs> and with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.